Um, thank you all so much for coming. Today, I'm really thrilled to introduce our speaker, Dr. Beck Strauss. Um, if during the talk you have questions, please go ahead and pop them in the chat when you have them, um, and then we will ask them uh, of Dr. Strauss at the end. Um, so uh, for the introduction, uh, since uh, 2019, Dr. Strauss has been a, a research scientist at the Materials and Measurements Laboratory of NIST based at NASA Goddard specifically performing calibration and benchmarking for the Planetary uh, Magnetospheres Group and uh, the Mid-Atlantic Noble Glass uh, Research Laboratory. Uh, Dr. Strauss received their PhD in 2016 from the University of Minnesota, and since that time has done uh, two postdocs, one at Rutgers. Um, of course, I believe that was with the wonderful Sonia Tiku, who I think is now at Stanford. She's lovely. Um, and then one at NIST. Uh, and I also found something I thought was pretty interesting when looking over Dr. Strauss's CV this morning. And that was that um, during their PhD, Dr. Strauss also did an internship at the company 3M, evaluating software for creating uh, digital elevation models or DEMs of uh, SEM data and created a tutorial for modeling uh, surface roughness. And I thought this was really cool because it was an example of how these analytics can be used at really different scales. So, you know, we're used to doing DEMs at a planetary scale, right? But I thought it was pretty cool that you're doing this kind of looking at an adhesive scale. So I thought that was really neat. Um, so uh, Dr. Strauss could tell us about a lot of different projects uh, on many different planetary bodies, including our own. Uh, but today we're going to learn about their work uh, in which they question the established understanding of the timing and possible drivers related to the moon's uh, magnetic field and its decline over time. So. Without further ado, take it away, Dr. Strauss. All right, there's the microphone. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. And I do also want to note, as you mentioned the 3M project, uh, I'm currently doing some surface roughness related work in that Mid-Atlantic Noble Gas Lab, um, partially in collaboration with someone who does topography work on volcanoes, because it turns out we learned exactly the same techniques at totally different scales and can still end up answering very similar questions. Uh, but that has nothing whatsoever to do with today's talk, which I'm going to assume from the uh, lack of responses that you can see the first slide for. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we can use Apollo samples to constrain the decline of the moon's magnetic field. So at Goddard, I primarily work with a planetary magnetospheres group. And what that group does is build fluxgate magnetometers for space missions, uh, along with associated research. We're often looking at active magnetic fields, which tell us a lot about present day planetary interiors, as well as things like plasma environments. But what about planets that aren't actively generating magnetic fields? What about planets like ours, where magnetic fields can change over time? Today, I hope to show you that a planet's history of magnetism can tell us about its evolution, particularly the evolution of its interior, as well as surface and subsurface processes. Now on terrestrial planets, these kinds of changes can be recorded in crustal rocks, and it's really rock level analyses that let us look not just at spatial patterns of magnetization, but also at how they've changed over billions of years. So I come to this topic from a background in rock magnetism and paleomagnetism, which I'll define briefly here in case these are new terms. So rock magnetism is the discipline that asks, how do rocks record magnetic fields? What kinds of mineralogies are required for rocks to hold records and how do they do it? Paleomagnetism then is the other side of that coin and asks, how do magnetic fields change over time based on the records held in rocks? Now, these are fairly broad headers for research disciplines, and the reason for this is that our fields are united more by a collection of instruments than by any coherent research objective. Now, what this means for planetary science is with access to the right kind of instrumentation, we have the ability to answer all kinds of questions and apply our techniques to all kinds of materials from all over our solar system, or really from anywhere we can get rocks. So today I'm gonna to be talking about an example from my current favorite place we've got rocks from, the Earth's moon. Uh, the Apollo sample suite includes more than 2000 rock, regolith and core samples. And we know from these samples that the moon used to have a pretty strong magnetic field, but it doesn't have one in the present day. So where did it go? Now, in order to understand the moon's magnetic field, I like to put previous studies on a timeline. So here on our x-axis, we have billions of years before present with the present day all the way to the right. 
And on our y-axis, we have paleo intensity in microteslas, or the strength of the ancient magnetic field. Please note that that's a log scale. Now there's two different kinds of data on this plot. The filled shapes indicate actual records of magnetic fields held in Apollo samples. And the open shapes indicate maximum intensities those fields could have had. And I'll come back to that in a couple of slides. I wanna point out some major trends on this plot uh, to help guide you through the data. First, there was a generally recognized high field period from about 3.85 to 3.56 billion years ago when the moon's magnetic field could have reached intensities comparable to the Earth's field today. Following that high field period, some subsequent studies showed that there was no evidence for fields any stronger than about four microteslas by about 3.19 billion years ago. From that information alone, we can start constructing this generic schematic timeline. This is not quantitative, it's really just intended to help guide your eye through the data. Now, a few years ago, uh, a study by Sonia Tiku, who was mentioned earlier, uh, showed a record of a field of about five microteslas in intensity in a sample dated to somewhere between one and two billion years of age. And then last year, a study came out showing no evidence for fields any stronger than 0.1 microteslas by about 500 million years ago, which gets us close to that zero field state we see today. So, this collection of data is, I think, really interesting because it tells us that the moon's field didn't just turn off overnight. Rather, there seem to have been two periods of decline in the intensity of the moon's magnetic field. A first period, an initial decline following the high field period, and then some secondary decline at some point to get to the zero field state we observe today, or excuse me, I should say the near zero field state. So why do we care about these changes in magnetic field intensity? Well, changes in a planet's magnetic field tell us something about changes in how that field is generated, particularly with regards to planetary interiors. Now, a whole bunch of different mechanisms, like at least a dozen mechanisms, have been proposed to explain how the moon's magnetic field was generated. And I'm just going to mention some of the major ones here today. Some studies have looked at chemical convection dynamos or impact generated dynamos, which could have accounted for fields on the order of maybe five to seven microteslas until about 3.8 billion years ago tops. Other studies have looked at precession generated dynamos where the interior and exterior portions of the moon could have been decoupled and that mechanical stirring might've generated the kind of current required to produce a magnetic field. This could have accounted for fields as strong as 100 microteslas, but wouldn't have been able to last past around 2 billion years ago, depending whose model you use. And still other studies have looked at thermochemical convection, which is the same kind of magnetic field generation mechanism that we have here on Earth today. This could have given fields as strong as 5 or 6 microteslas until maybe a billion years ago. What we'd really like to do is differentiate between these mechanisms and figure out which ones are the best candidates to explain the trends that we see. But you may be noticing there is really not very much data on this plot. And what that means is that we really need to keep an eye on both possible methodological problems and the potential for small number statistics issues. So if we want to constrain the timing of field decline and start really figuring out which of these mechanisms could actually explain the moon's changing magnetic field, we have to ask a couple of questions. First, did the lunar dynamo really decline after the high field period 3.56 billion years ago, or could we be looking at some kind of method issue or some kind of small number stats problem? And second, if it did decline, what happened to it? What kind of mechanism change could explain the, the pattern that we're seeing? To answer these questions, we need to work with samples that are capable of recording weak magnetic fields after 3.2 billion years ago. So this brings us to today's paleomagnetism case study. Uh, this is based on some experiments that I did as a postdoc at Rutgers and had been finishing up at NIST um, in, uh, in collaboration with Sonia Tiku, who as was mentioned earlier, is now at Stanford University. For the geologists in the room, I have to include a map of my uh, sample collection location. This is the Apollo 12 landing site on the moon, and all of the samples that I worked with came from sort of the like upper left edge of this image. Uh, I do have photos of two of the collection sites for the three samples I worked with. Unfortunately, there is no photo for the third one, and this is something that I use to tell my bosses at NASA that we need to send more geologists to the moon because we know to take a picture of the field site before we start moving rocks. So these are my actual samples that I was able to work with. Uh, these are Apollo 12 samples 12008, 
12009 and 12015. Uh, each of the samples in the photos you see here is about the size of the palm of your hand, though we of course receive much smaller portions to work with in our lab. And here is a picture of the actual, actual samples. Uh, that's my hand in the photo. You can see each of these little black meatloaf slices uh, is mounted on a quartz glass disc and has an orienting arrow so we can understand the uh, orientations of each subsample relative to the sample from which it was cut. All three of these samples are olivine vitrifier mare basalts and our microscopy didn't turn up any evidence of shock effects, which we interpret to mean they were likely magnetized through a thermal process, gathering a thermoremnant magnetization or TRM. We determined new argon-argon ages for two of these samples and the first ever argon-argon age for the third, dating all three of them to right around 3.1 billion years ago, exactly what we had hoped. And because these are uh, rapidly cooled rock types and the samples have fine overall grain size, we hope that they might contain some good paleomagnetic recorders. We were particularly interested in these bright grains that turned up in reflected light imagery, which we thought could be the iron nickel grains suggested by some previous studies. We ran all of our paleomagnetic experiments in the Rutgers Paleomagnetism Lab, which uh, unfortunately is no longer there and has moved with Sonia to Stanford. Uh, you can see in this image, we are looking at a room within a room. This is a magnetically shielded room, which has its own four wall ceiling and floor. They're insulated with multiple layers of steel and mu metal. And the effect is that inside this room, the Earth's magnetic field is attenuated almost to zero, which lets us have a really interesting amount of control to do some cool magnetic experiments. So if you walk up the steps to get inside and you leave your keys and phone and other magnetic paraphernalia outside the door, when you walk in, you see our 2G squid magnetometer. This is a uh, super cooled magnetometer that's capable of taking very, very sensitive measurements. When you step up onto the platform behind the magnetometer, you can see the actual instrument stack. On top, we have a degausser or AF coil, which can apply alternating fields to our sample to demagnetize it. I'll come back to that in a second. Below that is a zero region. And at the bottom is our measurement region, where we can take measurements on X, Y, and Z axes, which is a very exciting feature of these instruments. We can take three-dimensional measurements of a three-dimensional magnetization vector. You can also see our sample handling system. You might be able to make out this clear quartz glass tube, uh, which we could apply vacuum at the end in order to pick up and carry our samples up and down through that instrument stack so that we could pre-program some fairly complex experiments without having to sit there and like press a button every 30 seconds. So I'm gonna jump into our paleomagnetism results. The first question we asked was, did these samples record a field when they formed? The experiment that we ran in order to determine this was an alternating field demagnetization of natural remnant magnetization, which means we applied alternating magnetic fields of progressively stronger intensities to stepwise remove the magnetization that the samples walked into the lab with, essentially rewinding the process by which they were magnetized. Now, the results of these kinds of experiments get plotted in like a super weird way that only paleomagnetists do. So I'm gonna show you how we plot it and then I'm gonna show you my actual results. We're attempting to put a three-dimensional magnetic vector onto a two-dimensional page. So we start with a horizontal projection of that vector. We've got our north axis and our east axis and we start out at the NRM and as we apply stronger and stronger fields, the data tends towards zero as we're removing the magnetic signal then we can plot a vertical projection of the same vector data. Now we have our Z or up axis and our east axis, and that ends up looking a little bit like this. Same concept, same 3D vector, just being plotted in 2D space. Now when we combine these two plots, we get what's called a Zeidrefeld plot, and those usually end up looking a little bit like this. Now, this is my actual data. Uh, this is where Sonia put a little note in that said, pause for audience laughter, back when we could hear audience laughter. Uh, if you're looking at this and thinking that looks kind of like noise, you are correct. At least once we remove this low coercivity component that's consistent with the kind of overprint that a lot of Apollo samples pick up, partially from being returned to Earth or just from hanging out in the Earth's magnetic field for like 50 years. Once that low coercivity component has been removed, what remains is statistically indistinguishable from cooked spaghetti. And what this means for us is that we were not able to retrieve a stable high coercivity magnetization from these samples, which is kind of a bummer. But then we asked, how weak a field could they have recorded if there was one at the time? 
This is a particularly important question to ask when working with Apollo samples, because the paleomagnetic techniques used during the Apollo era were not always able to differentiate between samples that did not record an ancient magnetic field versus those that had poor remnants or poor recording properties, and samples that had experienced a strong paleo field versus those that had picked up some spurious remnants on Earth. Now, to determine fidelity limits for these three samples, essentially determine how weak a field they could have picked up, we performed a series of laboratory experiments in which we essentially applied a magnetic field of a known intensity to each sample to simulate the process that it went through on the moon, and then attempted to get back a record of that applied field using exactly the same techniques that I just showed you, the hope being that we should see a one-to-one -one relationship between the applied field and the retrieved field. So if you look at the leftmost figure here, I have the applied laboratory field on the x-axis and the retrieved paleo intensity on the y-axis. And ideally, all of our data should plot right on this one-to-one -one line I have in gray. Uh, but it's kind of hard to make out what's going on there. So if you instead look at the middle figure, now I have the applied field on the x-axis and the difference between the applied field and the retrieved field on the y. And if we use this 100% difference cut off from some previous studies, we find that two of our samples were able to give us back good records of magnetic fields as weak as seven microteslas. And one was able to give back records of magnetic fields as weak as four microtussels, which is pretty weak. So from this, we can say that our methods would have been able to retrieve records of a weak magnetizing field if it was any stronger than about four to seven microtussels. You may recall from two slides ago, we did no such thing. So with all of that information and with our new argon-argon dates, we can add our three samples to this timeline that I was just showing you, essentially quadrupling the amount of data available right around 3.1 to 3.2 billion years ago. Uh, our results are in very nice agreement with previous work, and that means this is essentially a replication study, which I think is very exciting because it lets us think back to that small number statistics issue I mentioned earlier. So we can ask the question then, is the decline after the high field period actually statistically significant. We wanted to compare the paleo intensities of samples from the high field period with younger samples from the initial period of decline and determine whether these two collections of points could actually be derived from the same distribution of paleo intensity values or if they're really different. Now, prior to our study, this null hypothesis could be rejected with a p-value of 0 0.0152, meaning they're, like, they're probably coming from different populations of, of data. Um, but when we add our three points and increase the amount of information that's available there, we can improve that p-value by an order of magnitude, which lets us state much more confidently that the moon's magnetic field underwent an order of magnitude decline following the high field period. Now, traditionally, this would be the part of the talk where we would go back to thinking about mechanisms to explain this decline and start digging into the various models that have been used. But I am not a modeler. I am an experimentalist, and instead, I want to talk about the question that had been bothering me this whole time. Why were our samples such good recorders? Or really, why were, we why were we able to replicate such a tight limit on the strength of the field? This is a table that we put together as we were building that timeline of previous studies of lunar paleo intensity. There's a lot here, and it's kind of small, but what you're looking at is uh, in the first column, sample identifiers, each of the different rocks that our data has come from. And the third column gives paleo intensities in microteslas. Now, I want to draw your attention to the intensities shown here with less than signs in front of them. These are actually paleomagnetic fidelity limits, indicating the maximum strength the field could have had when each sample formed based on the minimum field it would have been able to record. You'll notice that there is quite a range of paleo intensity fidelity limits reported here. Some samples could record fields weaker than one microtesla, while others could only record fields upwards of about 75 microteslas. I was really interested in this variation, particularly because our three samples exhibited extremely good, but not the best, magnetic recording properties. So we can use these three samples as kind of a case study to help us talk about the magnetic mineralogy of lunar rocks and how they might be recording these fields, or in our case, not recording them. Now, for some perspective, when we think about what's recording magnetic fields on the moon, we have to look all the way back to the Apollo era. 
early studies of Apollo samples indicated that their ferromagnetic mineralogy was dominated by metallic iron, FeO. This understanding was later expanded to include both iron metal and iron alloys with nickel and cobalt and other trace contaminants. And at that time, the most commonly found form was recognized as camisite, which is a body-centered cubic iron nickel alloy mineral. Now, over the past decade or so, excuse me, over the past decade or so, improved methods for the assessment of paleomagnetic fidelity have been accompanied by more detailed analyses of magnetic carrier minerals, including non-magnetic analyses that let us differentiate iron nickel alloys by mass fraction. For instance, we can now tell camisite, which is a low nickel alloy, apart from martensite, which has a higher nickel content. So if you're familiar with terrestrial paleomagnetism at all, you're, you're probably already realizing that lunar paleomag has a little bit of catching up to do. Although various magnetic parameters in lunar rocks have been surveyed to varying extents, including hysteresis and susceptibility, we're still kind of working on modernizing our approaches to experimental methods and the strategies that we use to interpret magnetic characterization data. Now, the goal here, or my goal here, is to advance astromaterial magnetism past simple expressions of bulk mineralogy, like I just showed you, and toward more complex explorations of grain and subgrain scale dynamics, especially with respect to magnetic domain behavior. Now, what I mean by that is we can think about a magnetic grain as subdivided into compartments that we call domains, each of which contains a magnetic moment. Smaller grains with fewer domains are expected to behave more predictably and hold records of magnetic fields for longer. But how small is smaller? How long is longer? Now, the first question I really wanted to answer here is what are those, mag those metallic grains, excuse me, that we turned out during microscopy? What you're looking at here are qualitative elemental X-ray maps, which we collected in addition to obtaining quantitative points from individual grains using electron probe microanalysis, also conducted at Rutgers. If you take a look at the third column where everything is kind of a navy color, we have iron in blue and nickel in green. So what we can tell from just this subsample of our images is we've definitely got iron nickel grains in these samples. Cool, very exciting. Uh, more exciting are some other features of these grains that we noticed. First, we found grains with different iron nickel ratios within each sample, and we were able to identify both camisite and martensite based on those ratios. In fact, we mostly found martensite, where studies of other samples from similar parts of the Apollo suite have found predominantly camisite. We also noticed that many of those iron nickel grains are not homogeneous, and you can actually see it in these figures. You can kind of make out some compositional gradients along this top grain and uh, also in, on this lower one where there's more nickel to one side. We also observed some bright submicron scale grains that were unfortunately too small for us to acquire quantitative points from. Uh, but mainly what we can take away from this is that we observed multiple sizes of both camisite and martensite, which is pretty cool. Now, we were also looking at some previous studies that suggested association with troilite, which is an iron sulfide mineral, might be an indicator of paleomagnetic fidelity in lunar basalts. So we went looking for it per this fourth column, where now we have uh, sulfur in pink, excuse me, and iron in blue. And we didn't find any grains with compositions consistent with troilite. So it seems that in general, troilite may form through processes that also produce the kind of submicron iron grains that we're interested in, but it's definitely not a requirement for high paleointensity fidelity. Okay, so then we asked, uh, what happens when we apply fields to these samples? And we did a series of room temperature hysteresis experiments, which are kind of a bread and butter technique for rock, ma rock magnetism and have been so for more than 50 years. In a hysteresis experiment, we are applying a magnetic field under controlled conditions and measuring magnetization as it's applied. So we apply a field that increases in intensity in some positive direction, return that field to zero, apply the same intensity of field in the opposite direction, and then return to zero. And we track changes in magnetization as that happens, knowing that ferromagnetic materials respond in a very particular way here. Now, uh, here are loops from representative subsamples of each of my samples. We've got our applied field in Teslas on the x-axis and our measured magnetic moment on the y. Uh, and I have our raw data in orange and the corrected data in blue. Uh, 
I've also extracted some coercivity and magnetization parameters that define the shape and size of each loop. And this is where it actually starts to get interesting because since hysteresis loops have been a standard practice for so long, this lets us start thinking about comparing our results with data that goes back to the Apollo era. So we can ask how other Apollo samples compare and think about sources of variation in fidelity limits beyond just my three samples. What I'm showing here is a day plot, and these are typically used to understand how hysteresis parameters of different samples compare to each other. On the x-axis, we have remnant coercivity divided by coercive force, and on the y-axis, we have saturation remnant magnetization divided by saturation magnetization. And all of that aside, the hope with a day plot is that samples with better recording properties should plot toward the upper left, and that should correspond with better magnetic fidelity. So what we've built is, to our knowledge, the largest published compilation of hysteresis parameters from Apollo samples to date. Each data point that you're seeing here represents one sample or subsample from the literature, sorted by bulk rock type as kind of a first pass, and the data from our study is shown in orange squares up here. So I've also included these gray dashed lines, uh, which indicate domain state regions from the original day plot that were often used to interpret uh, grain size. I'll note the positions of samples from a few recent studies on this figure, just sort of by way of example, and you can kind of get a sense from this handful of points that the general trend that we're hoping for does seem to hold. We see better, lower fidelity limits as we move toward the upper left of the plot. However, there is a problem when we start to look at those domain states, which again, are what grain sizes often get inferred from. And the problem is those dashed lines don't actually exist. Those guiding domain parameter ranges were originally developed for magnetite, Fe304. And not only are they not applicable to other types of magnetic minerals, but studies of terrestrial minerals in the last few years have shown that they were likely fairly imprecise tools in the first place and can unfortunately encourage overinterpretation of our actual data. So I'm very proud of the data compilation that we've assembled here, but I caution against the use of day plots to discern specific domain states or grain sizes of magnetic minerals in lunar samples, mainly because not a single one of the samples shown on this plot contain magnetite. Okay, so we've talked a bit about grain size and long story short, we see some interesting mismatches between petrographically observed grain sizes and those that are often inferred from magnetic measurements by way of domain states. And in our samples specifically, we observed two different populations of iron nickel grains that we wouldn't have been able to differentiate from hysteresis experiments alone. We also took a very quick look at the association of iron nickel grains with other minerals. And I didn't even mention magnetic anisotropy. And now I'm working on digging into compositional variations among iron nickel alloys, which I personally think is really interesting. Uh, we're having some discussions about whether it would be informative to calculate theoretical domain state regions and day curves for iron minerals, which wouldn't tell us anything about grain sizes necessarily without some experimental grounding, but could give us a sense of how far off we currently are from reality. So where do we go from here? First, the data that we use to build the day plot I showed is freely available at the NIST data repository, which you can find at this URL, uh, as well as in the supplemental information for the paper that we just published in JGR Planets. And I highly encourage you, if you're interested in these kinds of questions, to go play around with that data yourself and see if you can find any patterns. I also want to encourage our research community to collect more first order reversal curves and make them a routine part of lunar magnetic analyses, just like we do for terrestrial analyses. First order reversal curves essentially fill in the empty space in a hysteresis loop, and they're able to give us a lot more information about different populations of grains and the interactions between them, as well as information about potential anisotropies. Now, something like half the data on that day plot was collected before this technique was even invented. So this isn't just about future studies of samples that have never been analyzed before, but also about taking care in how we revisit these kinds of archival collections. I'm showing an example here from a paper that came out last year, just so you have some sense of what this can look like. The clast on the left has this horizontal ridge that extends to fairly high coercivities, and that suggests the presence of single domain and pseudo single domain grains. Well, the glass on the right, in addition to that ridge, also has this cluster at low coercivity values, which suggests the presence of larger multi-domain grains. And I can tell you all of that totally independent of a day plot. 
Now, this is the part where if you have fallen asleep or been checking your phone anytime in the last 20 minutes or so, I'm going to attempt to summarize the entire talk in under two minutes. Here we go. What happened to the lunar field after 3.56 billion years ago, the end of the high field period? Well, our methods would have been able to retrieve a record of the field if it was any stronger than roughly four to seven microtesselas. However, we did not retrieve a stable record of a magnetization consistent with that kind of planetary field. Therefore, we find no evidence for lunar surface fields any stronger than seven microtesselas at about 3.1 billion years ago. As a reminder, the field was an order of magnitude stronger at about 3.56. So this is a decline of an order of magnitude over around 400 million years. In order to explain this, this change from a high field state to a weak field state, we need either multiple mechanisms of field generation or some kind of bistable dynamo that could have been stable in both configurations. Among the available candidates, we currently think the best candidates or the most likely ones are a combination of precession and thermochemical convection. And what this could look like is a precession generated dynamo uh, driving the existence of a strong magnetic field until the moon's gravitational state as it moved away from the earth was no longer conducive to sustaining it. And when that gave way, it could reveal some underlying thermochemical convection system that could have been there all along and would account for the weak field period that has been shown to last until maybe a billion years ago. And finally, uh, we are exploring how this evidence is actually held in lunar rocks, and it seems like it's contained in a variety of iron nickel minerals. We're just starting to understand exactly how. And with that, uh, I will leave up some takeaways. I want to say thank you to the CAPTEM program for sample allocation. It has been a huge honor to work with Apollo Material as an early career researcher. Um, and uh, with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Strauss. And so everyone who is listening, feel free to uh, drop your questions in the chat. Uh, and I, we may even be able to turn on people's mics. I don't know, uh, Alicia knows that, but um, feel free to drop the questions in the chat and I will certainly ask those questions uh, for you. So, and I'll, I'll start with a question. Um, so, and this is a question that you've probably already asked and this is probably a pretty easy answer for you, but. Is there anything else that could have, um, okay, and I do see we have a hand raised, but is there anything else that could have caused the loss of that um, magnetic signal in those grains that you that's preventing you from being able to detect it? Again, I know this is something you've probably thought, but me not being in magnetism, it's like, okay, was there anything else that could have potentially caused this? That's, that's a very reasonable question and one that we actually do ask a lot, which is part of why we're so careful in our methods. Many of the Apollo samples, okay, maybe not many, but like a bunch of the Apollo samples have been remagnetized. And this is something that was never intentional and this is not meant as a slight against JFC or the Apollo program or anything like that. Um, but the, the sample handling protocols that were originally designed for these samples were created without our current methods in mind. Makes sense, right? It was 50 years ago, we didn't know how to do the things that we know now. Um, but what this means is that there are some uh, fairly well-known samples in lunar paleomag that are infamous due to having been overprinted by circular saw cutting. So the, the introduction of both a circular motion of metallic object and the heat that's associated with that can overprint a lot of the magnetic signal that we're interested in. And that makes the sample not as useful for paleomag. These particular samples were originally requested because they had never been touched with a circular saw. So we know that that is not one of the routes by which we could have lost mag or more likely gained spurious mag. Um, there's also been some attention paid recently to the kinds of magnetic environments that samples undergo during transportation. So the transit from the moon to the earth. And uh, there have been a couple of studies looking at the possibility of isothermal overprinting in other samples. And I'm having some conversations with, with folks at work about things like Mars sample return and um, other kinds of sample return, potentially with Artemis, about how we can um, how we can prevent the need to have concern about that kind of loss. Um, but these three particular samples that I worked with were, were fairly confident that the lack of signal is original. We don't find evidence for any of these kinds of secondary mechanisms to get rid of it. Okay, that's fantastic. And yeah, what, what I'm hearing from all of this is, and you bring up Artemis, is the need for, 
um, you know, having people like you having some input on how this is, these samples are being handled now that we know so much more than we did, um, you know, decades ago. So awesome. Thank you. So we have a couple of people have their hands raised. So Peter Driscoll, why don't you ask your question first? Sure. Thank you, Beck. That was very interesting. My question um, is about that one data point that you didn't talk about much, uh, the blue diamond, blue triangle around two, two and a half billion years ago. All right, I meant to leave this slide up and then I closed it. Let me, here you go, visual reference. You're talking about, uh, do, I have, do I have a laser pointer? There we go, this data point. Yes. Yes. So can you tell us like, what is that data point? Is it multiple analysis on a single sample or is it multiple samples? And what's the recorder? And you know, what do you, do you know anything about that point? Yep, um, so that one is, I can tell you it's sample number 15498. Uh, it was analyzed by Sonia when she was a PhD student at MIT. So the analyses were at the MIT lab and then she was finishing that up as she came to Rutgers. Um, and the paleomag analyses for that, when I say it's one sample, I mean it's one main sample and she was using I want to say something like six subsamples of that sample. I, I'm also showing data from like five or six subsamples per sample. Um, and the record that was found there uh, is, as far as I know, that is the only study from that time period, just in general, not only the only one to show a record, but just the only paleomagnetic analysis, analysis we have from that, uh, that era. Prior to the publication of that study, we didn't know that there was the potential for a weak field period at all. So this is a point that has provoked, I guess, a, a fair amount of controversy. The paper itself is in Science Advances and I highly recommend checking it out because I'm like reaching into the back of my brain to try to get the details. Mm -hmm. um, but was it an Apollo sample? It was an Apollo sample. I think it, I think it was a breccia, but if it wasn't a breccia, it was a basalt. Um, but yeah, every, everything currently on that plot is Apollo samples. Okay, thanks. Yep. Oh, and I do also, I should also note that the wide date range on that is sort of part of why there's been a lot of conversation about it. The dates that I'm showing are the revised ages from the Bigani paper that came out in 2020. So that's a much tighter range than it previously had. Great, thank you. And then I think Connell had his hand raised. Yeah, I, I, I had a similar question to Peter. Um, I, you know, I would be surprised if it was a basalt. I didn't think the moon was volcanically active by that stage, but uh, um, so I, I guess I should go and look at the paper. I'm um, pulling it up right now because right. I would like to know. Uh, it is a breccia. It is okay. a glassy regolith breccia okay. from so Apollo. It's a, so it's an impact melt, presumably, that uh, is recording the field at that particular time. Um, yes. Yes, and that's part of why its um, potential for paleomagnetism is exciting because with an impact melt, if we can date the impact, we know exactly when the sample should have cooled through its blocking temperature. Right. Um, so I guess uh, at least with, when people are looking at mag magnetic uh, magnetism in meteorites, there's the issue of whether impacts themselves can generate a magnetic field temporarily. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the question is, is, is that from the uh, being generated by the moon itself or just by the impact? The, you mean the, the field that's held in this particular sample? Uh, right. the, my understanding of that paper and that point, and again, this is not my paper. So sure. um, it, my understanding of it is that the field that it recorded was most likely the moon's magnetic field itself. And most of the arguments around this come from the timing of impact generated fields. So in order for a cooling rock to record an impact on the moon, the amount of time it takes for the sample to cool must correspond with the amount of time that the field was in a particular configuration. And if an impact generated field was extremely brief on the order of like hours to days, and the sample took several weeks to cool, we wouldn't get a good record of that field. Whereas if there was a relatively stable field that is the same from week to week, and the sample took that long to cool, then we're more likely to trap a good record of it. Um, this is me sort of going around an actual answer to your question, because I would also like to double check the paper to make sure. <laughs> um, but the there's been some more recent work by, uh, by Sonia and other people looking at the kinds of magnetic fields that impacts are able to generate 
in general with a lot more modeling background to it. And I think those are very interesting, informative papers about these exactly these kinds of concerns. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Connell. And then we have another uh, question from Alan Boss. Alan, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, uh, Beck, for a really interesting talk. Uh, I, I spent most of the last three weeks overseeing uh, the critical design review for a chronograph for the Roman Space Telescope. And one of the issues they worried about quite a bit was the, uh, the testing of the labs where they are testing out the components and especially electromagnetic interference. So I saw your Faraday cage. You say you leave your phone outside, your keys outside. Then you go inside the Faraday cage and you got all these electronics in there, right? Uh, that's Water not right Faraday cage. Place. So question is what happens if you put a sample you has non-magnetic in your chamber and do your testing? What's the, what's the noise as it were that's gonna be there do your test setup, thanks. So the answer is that actually is not a Faraday cage. There are, for folks in the room who don't do this, um, there are basically two main kinds of quote unquote magnetic shield rooms. There is a Faraday cage, which is electromagnetic shielding. And that's the kind where you walk inside with your phone and you suddenly don't get signal because EM waves are not going through. And then there is a static magnetically shielded room, like the one that I was showing here, which is designed to not allow static fields through. So the Earth's magnetic field is getting blocked because for our purposes, it's like basically the same day to day, um, but you can use a cell phone inside. You shouldn't, but you can, you can get a cell signal in there. And what this means for the kinds of samples that we're working with, because I'm not working with electronics, I'm working with rocks. All of the instrumentation inside of that room is designed by companies that just do magnetism research, essentially. So every instrument that I showed has its own many layers of shielding. All of the storage that we have inside is shielded with, with mostly new metal. Um, all of the furniture is made of wood and we have to use was it was it brass screws there's like some really annoying material we have to get for screws and then like we have to get uh non-magnetic screwdrivers and things like that to build things it was really fun putting this lab together um so the kinds of devices and instrumentation and rock sample storage honestly that i'm showing in a static magnetic room for paleomagnetism experiments are not the same kinds of technologies that you need if you're doing something that's sensitive to em my rocks do not care if my phone is next to them, except that the phone is magnetic. The, the, the like EM waves are not a concern for the kind of studies that we're doing. Um, that being said, there are a bunch of facilities, including uh, one of the ones that I'm associated with at Goddard that do some very intense or intensive uh, EM testing for space flight. And if you want folks to talk to you about those kinds of things, honestly, the, the people that I work with, the engineers know far more than I ever will. And I highly recommend them as, as resources. Well, it's too bad you weren't able to give this talk in person at EPL because we have a, in our lobby of our main building, a model of the ship, the Carnegie, which was a non-magnetic yacht with a brass engine. And so we might, might have been some lessons learned there, you know, use wood and brass. So. Anyway, thank you, Beck. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Whenever you are able to come and visit uh, our campus, we'll have to show you the model of the ship, which my understanding is after it did this huge magnetic survey of the ocean burned in the port, unfortunately. So it no longer exists, but we do have a beautiful model of it. And, and yeah, when you talk about these non-magnetic screwdrivers, I'm thinking about hearing about, you know, these brass screws and stuff that were holding things together. It's pretty cool. Um, so we have another question, um, and Faye, take it away. Yes, and uh, a really interesting talk. And uh, so, so I'm trying to understand, you know, this, I mean, obviously your conclusion is says no evidence for lunar fields larger than uh, seven uh, micro Tesla. So, 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 so my question is, what's the low limit? What you need to get? I mean, potentially it could be dropped to the current, right? And is, is that a fair question? So we are hinge, hinge on one measurements is at 1.5 billion years. Is, is, is that what, uh, uh, because this potentially has huge implications for the magnetic mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are asking, uh, let, let's call it the million dollar question if we can get grant money. Um, the, the, there are really two things that go into putting the kind of limit that I've put on the potential strength of the field at any given point. Number one is the sample has to have been capable of recording it. 
And number two is we have to be able to get that record back. And that's why the points that I have in pink triangles at the like one to 0.5 billion year mark on this figure are so enticing because those samples are very good magnetic recorders and they were analyzed on an instrument that could go to lower fields than the one that I used. Now, this is sometimes a case of being in the right place at the right time to collaborate with the people who have the magnetometer that you want. Um, but I think that the, the presence of one of those points right around, the, I think it's like 0.85 or 0.9 billion years of age, which is right near the tail of the potential date for this one five microtesla point, um, is a very good argument in favor of letting us do those kinds of analyses with that kind of instrument on more samples from these really interesting inflection points. And I would very much like to believe that the, the point from the 2017 study I have in the purple triangle is real, that we really have a weak field period, because that just like is a really cool story. Um, but I think that the responsible thing to do as researchers would be to continue to both replicate these kinds of studies with the best instrumentation we can get access to, but also increase the number of samples that we have done any of these kinds of analyses to at all. Because we are making fairly big conclusions from a fairly small number of points. So yeah, that is, that is uh, a question that I have asked myself many a time and would very much like to get some real answers to. Thank you, Faye. So I have another question, if you don't mind. How many samples um, are still around that we currently have on Earth now that you would like to do these studies for? I mean, are there still samples that you're hoping to get your hands on that are in good enough shape that you could examine? Uh, so I uh, just got my very first NASA proposal rejected to do exactly what you're talking about. This still counts as an accomplishment. I'm new here and I'm learning how to write proposals. It's great. Um, but I, I am really interested in the, I think I said earlier, there are about 2000 samples in the Apollo suite, maybe a little more than that. And a generous estimate would be that several hundred of those are very viable candidates for the kind of paleomag stuff we're talking about. Now, there, there are some questions about like whether we can get the perfect Goldilocks sample that has been, uh, let's see, it needs to be a rock type that we can do meaningful analyses with. So like we, we love a basalt, we love a breccia. Um, we need it to have been handled in a way that it's not completely remagnetized. So ideally either not circular saw cut or there being enough of the sample away from that cut plane that we can still work with this chunk. And we also need it to be from a time period that's interesting. And this is where I'm starting to have some conversations with my volcanology colleagues at Goddard because I admittedly don't know the volcanic history of the moon as well as I could. Um, but we're trying to figure out whether there are samples distributed other places along the timeline that are currently less filled in that we could do some really interesting analyses with. So the short version of the answer to that is I need to work on revising my PDART proposal to submit again because I think that having a better um, like archival collection of even characterization data for these samples would make it so much easier for paleomagnetists to come in and choose. I want to play with this sample from 3.1 billion years ago that I know should hold a field because it does this, that, and the other thing, the magnetometer. Like just having any of that information would be such a big deal. So yes, working on it. Wow, that sounds like a great PDART proposal. And having had a PDART rejected myself, um, I, yeah, I feel, I feel your pain, um, but that sounds like a great proposal. So hopefully uh, in the future, you can get that. Um, and so, okay, so obviously we're going to the moon and we're gonna be returning samples. Do you feel that there's going to be, uh, that, that samples that could help your work are going to be focused on with return? I mean, do you have a feel for kind of what their scientific goals are going to be with returning these samples? I don't know a lot about these missions. I'm really not in this world. So I'm kind of interested in kind of like the broad, what sort of stuff are they gonna bring back and what kind of questions are they gonna try sure. to answer? Um, so I, I am also just sort of starting to learn about missions. That's one of the exciting things about being on Detail to Goddard is I get to ask people these kinds of questions to their faces. Um, so I've had some really interesting conversations with folks associated with Artemis. Um, I, I work in a, basically like geology, geophysics, geochemistry part of Goddard. And Goddard is where many of NASA's, you can think of it, think of it as like R&D experiments take place. So we have a lot of planetary scientists who get attached to missions. And my impression from them is that paleomagnetism 
is not a priority. It's nobody's priority. And we're kind of used to this as a field. Like we kind of um, have figured out a lot of techniques to use material that was collected for other purposes. We're very thrifty like that. Um, but the place where we can have productive conversations is about how to make sure samples that are prioritized for other reasons, excuse me, stay useful for paleomagnetists because we can get a lot of cool information out of these things. Priorities on the moon and priorities on Mars are, as I understand it, fairly similar in that we're all about sustaining human life and we're all about ancient biosignatures. And neither of those things have anything to do with paleomagnetism, unless you wanna make arguments about magnetic shielding to conserve atmospheres and like finding buried features that are interesting and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's um, an important argument, I would say. I, I think that's a, that's a pretty important, especially on Mars. I mean, you know, maybe on the moon, it's a little bit harder to make that argument, but that's a pretty important argument on Mars. I, I think it's very important. I think these things are very important, but they're not really part of the like initial conception of many of these missions. So a lot of the conversations that I'm currently having are about, okay, you already have plans to collect this kind of sample from that kind of feature. What are your tools made of? What are you doing with the sample once it's picked up? What is it being stored in? How is it being handled on its way back into the or are they calling it like a hub or a hab or whatever? And like when you put it on the ship, is the compartment that it's in shielded in any kind of way? Is it going to be near something that generates a magnetic field? So I don't necessarily expect that we will be priorities for the selection of sampling locations and samples themselves. Um, but the folks that I've spoken with have been extremely receptive to these kinds of concerns because if you're prioritizing something like you know, looking, looking for water. And I say, I come from a whole additional research community that can also really benefit from and get you cool information from these samples. If you just build the box, you put them in a little bit differently. Um, folks have been very excited about and responsive to those kinds of things. I am trying to like get my foot in the door on the Mars stuff though, because I think we are far enough out from some of those missions that if I say, hey, what if we had a drill that orients things, we might get traction. Um, but this is just sort of me envisioning a potential future. I have no actual evidence that any of this is going to happen. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I mean, I think, you know, as I mentioned, that argument for why this is important on Mars, I think actually really is, is pretty important. And I think this whole more bang for your buck, right? It's like we're going and if you don't have to do a, a huge thing, then, you know, hey, why not? Why not? So I think selling yourself that way is like really smart. Um, so let's see, we have another question. So Mike Walter, why don't you go ahead with your question? Thanks, Beck. That was really, really interesting. I'm going to hammer a little bit more on this, um, on these points around 3.2 billion. Um, because I'm noticing that all of those particular points don't have a lower limit. So I guess that's just basically the sensitivity of, of, of the measurements in each of those cases. So just to kind of further to Faye's point, and, and I think maybe Connell's as well, is that those, those magnetic field strings could be much lower. So in, in principle, so the, the question is this, let's say they were much lower. Let's say they actually were one or less than one maybe something similar to what we see now in the 1 billion year samples. Is that ridiculous from the point of view that you would not be able to explain the 1.2 billion year old sample? It's not ridiculous at all, actually. You, you reminded me of the phrase that I was supposed to say earlier. Um, these, these points around that period, any of the points that I show that are open, don't have a lower limit because they are maximum intensities those samples could have recorded. And it is absolutely 100% correct that I am showing only upper limits in those areas and I'm not showing lower limits. And what this means for exactly the kind of scenario you're describing is I have no way to tell you if the moon's magnetic field, just by way of example, like turned on and turned off and turned on and turned off and turned on and turned off, like we would not know. We also don't know if there were magnetic reversals. None of these points are oriented. And something that we know from terrestrial studies is that periods of reversal are often associated with declines in the field intensity or sort of vice versa. Versa, We often see a decrease in field intensity before the field flips and reestablishes stronger. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that I, I think we can really only answer through increasing our data density, essentially. If we have a, if we have the ability to put very good limits on the maximum field, 
if we can get those points closer together, I think that'll be a really powerful tool. Like when I say I can't tell you if the moon has magnetic reversals, that's like really frustrating to me as someone who came from terrestrial mag. Um, but this is also something that I've seen um, I've seen some really intriguing conversations, some unpublished stuff about whether we can reconstruct orientations for any of these samples, which might tell us something about polarity. Like if, for instance, we found out that one of these samples recorded an up and one recorded a down, there necessarily would have had to been a transition period between those. Um, and this is also why we get into the, the future sampling methods thing. The main point that I say to everyone I talk to is if you can just tell me which way is up, we can completely revolutionize a lot of this field. But yeah, to, to get to your actual point, um, you are very correct that it could be a lot lower. And I don't know how likely it is that the moon's field was like zigging up and down at the, uh, at the magnitude that I currently have it in this figure. But if we think about the Earth's magnetic field for comparison, we know that it's very possible for a planet to have some very dramatic changes in intensity over time. So yeah, totally viable. Would love to do more experiments and find out. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just hearing more experiments, more missions. Yeah, lots of things that lots of things to work on for a long time in the future. Okay, I think that we have asked you a lot of questions. Thank you so much for uh, answering all of these for us and so much for uh, coming in and sharing your work with us. We really enjoyed having you and uh, we hope to have you back in the future uh, to talk about other things. So thank you so much and, and thank you everyone for tuning in. So yes. The silent Thanks so much for having me. Um, I, I do want to say all of these questions are like fantastic questions of exactly the variety I love to get. Um, so if I if I don't have a chance to follow up with you or if you didn't get a chance to ask or you have more burning thoughts, I do have my contact information on this slide. I love yelling about Lunar Paleo Mag. Please feel free to get in touch to continue these kinds of conversations. And, and thank you again so much for having me today. Thank you, Beck. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.